The Old Man and the Sea by Ernest Hemingway It was getting into the afternoon, and the boat still moved slowly and steadily. But there was an added drag now from the easterly breeze, and the old man rode gently with the small sea and the hurt of the cord across his back came to him easily and smoothly. Once in the afternoon, the line started to rise again. But the fish only continued to swim at a slightly higher level. The sun was on the old man's left arm and shoulder and on his back. So he knew the fish had turned east of north. Now that he had seen him once, he could picture the fish swimming in the water with his purple pectoral fins set wide as wings and the great erect tail slicing through the dark. I wonder how much he sees at that depth, the old man thought. His eye is huge, and a horse with much less eye can see in the dark. Once, I could see quite well in the dark. Not in the absolute dark, but almost as a cat sees. The sun and his steady movement of his fingers had uncramped his left hand now completely, and he began to shift more of the strain to it, and he shrugged the muscles of his back to shift the hurt of the cord a little. If you're not tired, fish, he said aloud. You must be very strange. He felt very tired now, and he knew the night would come soon, and he tried to think of other things. He thought of the big leagues. To him, they were the Gran Ligas, and he knew that the Yankees of New York were playing the Tigres of Detroit. This is the second day now that I do not know the result of the Juegos, he thought. But I must have confidence, and I must be worthy of the great DiMaggio, who does all things perfectly, even with the pain of the bone spur in his heel. What is a bone spur? he asked himself. Un espuela de nuezo. We do not have them. Can it be as painful as the spur of a fighting cock in one's heel? I do not think I could endure that or the loss of the eye and of both eyes and continue to fight as the fighting cocks do. Man is not much beside the great birds and beasts. Still, I would rather be that beast down there in the darkness of the sea. Unless sharks come, he said aloud. If sharks come, God pity him and me. Do you believe the great DiMaggio would stay with a fish as long as I will stay with this one, he thought. I am sure he would, and more, since he is young and strong. Also, his father was a fisherman. But would the bone spur hurt him too much? I do not know, he said aloud. I never had a bone spur. As the sun set, he remembered, to give himself more confidence, the time in the tavern at Casablanca when he had played the hand game with the great negro from Cienfuegos, who was the strongest man on the docks. They had gone one day and one night with their elbows on a chalk line on the table, and their forearms straight up and their hands gripped tight. Each one was trying to force the other's hand down onto the table. There was much betting, and people went in and out of the room under the kerosene lights, and he had looked at the arm and hand of the Negro and at the Negro's face. They changed the referees every four hours after the first eight so that the referees could sleep 
Blood came out from under the fingernails of both his and the Negro's hands, and they looked each other in the eye and at their hands and forearms, and the betters went in and out of the room and sat on high chairs against the wall and watched. The walls were painted bright blue and were of wood, and the lamps threw their shadows against them. The negro's shadow was huge, and it moved on the wall as the breeze moved the lamps. The odds would change back and forth all night, and they fed the negro rum and lighted cigarettes for him. Then the negro, after the rum, would try for a tremendous effort, and once he had the old man, who was not an old man then, but was Santiago el Campeón, nearly three inches off his balance. But the old man had raised his hand up to dead even again. He was sure then that he had the Negro, who was a fine man and a great athlete, beaten. And at daylight, when the betters were asking that it be called a draw, and the referee was shaking his head, he had unleashed his effort and forced the hand of the negro down and down until it rested on the wood. The match had started on a Sunday morning and ended on a Monday morning. Many of the betters had asked for a draw because they had to go to work on the docks loading sacks of sugar or at the Havana Coal Company. Otherwise, everyone would have wanted it to go to a finish. But he had finished it anyway, and before anyone had to go to work. For a long time after that, everyone had called him the champion, and there had been a return match in the spring. But not much money was bet, and he had won it quite easily since he had broken the confidence of the Negro from Cienfuegos in the first match. After that, he had a few matches, and then no more. He decided that he could beat anyone if he wanted to badly enough, and he decided that it was bad for his right hand for fishing. He had tried a few practice matches with his left hand, but his left hand had always been a traitor and would not do what he called on it to do, and he did not trust it. The sun will bake it out well now, he thought. It should not cramp on me again unless it gets too cold in the night. I wonder what this night will bring. An aeroplane passed overhead on its course to Miami, and he watched its shadow scaring up the schools of flying fish. With so much flying fish, there should be dolphin, he said, and leaned back on the line to see if it was possible to gain any on his fish. But he could not, and it stayed at the hardness and water drop shivering that preceded breaking. The boat moved ahead slowly, and he watched the aeroplane until he could no longer see it.